The, the first question, Mr. Belgar, to you, you, uh, you got $200 million for, that, for Aboriginal education in the budget. Uh, you said that was a missed opportunity. The First Nations Education Act, which didn't happen, had a further $1.9 million. And you were talking about significant catch-up arrangements in terms of education. What, in your view, would constitute a significant catch-up uh, arrangement? Well, again, it's a good question. And, uh, you know, with Bill C-33, there was a, a, a price tag of $1.9 billion that was attached to Bill C-33. And it was a flawed process, you know, which why it was really slowed down in Canada. You know, 500 million of that 1.9 billion was for schools, for infrastructure. But when you break that down, even that figure down, 500 million dollars for schools, it doesn't flow right away, and it's spread out over a number of years. You have 634 communities. How many schools is that going to build? Not a lot. Not a lot. But that's the 500 million dollar piece in, off that 1.9. When we met with the Prime Minister, we said, hey, there's 1.4 billion still left there. 1.4 billion. Don't reprofile it. Don't reclassify it. Leave it for education. You know? It's not going to be enough to close the gap, but it's a start. You know? And so my understanding is. there's an escalator built into that, right? To the yeah, 4.5 percent. But it's a start. You know, we got to do the proper assessment analysis to get the right stats, the right figures, you know? I always say, anytime there's an announcement of federal dollars, is it enough? Probably never be enough, but it's a start. So let's build upon that. You know? And so the dollars that I know, and, and Minister Melcourt is quite tied it to, to Bill C-33, well, our chiefs are clear. Let's establish a proper fiscal framework here with the federal government. And I mentioned early on, proper process that's respectful. So we can work out a, a proper process to establish a proper curriculum and everything else in place that we can start closing the gap. So that's what our chiefs have said, we're gonna keep working towards that. And because Bill C-33 is on the shelf, Phil, don't stop, come back. Come back and keep reaching out. And Mr. Barton, you, you we spoke a earlier about this, but you didn't see that the First Nations Education Control Act was transformative enough. Wasn't, well, it wasn't transformative at all. The back, the back of the matter is that we take a look at the, they appointed an overall committee an overall committee that was going to advise the minister. The fact is the chairman was named by the minister. The, um, all of the members who were going to be on there except for four uh, were going to be named by the minister. And the four who were not uh, were going to be, which could be recommended uh, by the AFN, um, had to have the approval of the minister. And this is, this is supposed to be First Nations control of education. Forget about it. This was, what this was, was a takeover bid. I spent some time in business. I know what a takeover bid was. Like, and that's what this was for sure. And at the same time, as, as, as the Grand Chief has just said, the amount of money that was in the bill was totally insufficient to do the job. And the fact is the money wasn't going to go for, flow for two years. And let me just ask you one thing. The funding differential is so gross between what a, a public school receives from the provinces and what was being offered uh, to, to, the, to the First Nations uh, in this, in, the, in, this uh, in Bill C-33 C um, as to be virtually lapable. It just simply was not sufficient money that any educator who understands the costs of education, especially the cost of education in the North, the cost of education in rural areas, and the fact of the matter is to say that this is the amount of money that we're going to put on the table in order to affect reform. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's inconceivable. And in fact, it, it's morally wrong. And I think that what happened, and, and the, let me tell you the last thing. The fact of the matter is when we did Kelowna, Kelowna was done over an 18-month period. There were tables established there in a, a series of different areas, all of which, by the way, there were tables that were asked for by the AFN and the Métis leadership and the EU leadership. They decided what the heck the, the agenda was going to be. Those tables broke up on a periodic basis to give, in fact, the negotiators a chance to go back to their communities and consult with their people and basically establish who came to come back. Everybody understands that that is the way you have to deal with a number of communities that exist within, uh, within the AFN. The government refused to do that. The government refused to give the, the, those who were at the table with them the opportunity to consult with their people. We saw what happened. 
And the process was there, and I can tell you, the government may have walked away from Kelowna, but they cannot walk away from the Kelowna process. Regardless of who's to blame, and there's plenty of blame to go around, it looks right now like the, 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 the whole uh, situation is stalled. Um, talking to senior bureaucrats, they say they don't know whether they have a partner that they can rely on that can deliver, because clearly there was internal dissent within the AFN, the National Chief, your predecessor, found that he didn't have support within the movement. Can you now assure the government that, that you are a, a, a prospective partner and you can move forward together? Of course. We've got a chief's mandate in December. They, they want a, another process that's respectful of First Nations jurisdiction. Uh, again, we have uh, the mechanisms we have within the Assembly of First Nations, we have the Chiefs' Assembly. We meet twice a year. July 7, 8, 9, we're going to meet in Montreal. Next December, we're, we're here for twice a year. I always make the standing invitations for the Prime Minister of Canada, we address the Chiefs of Canada. But we have the Chiefs in Assembly. We have our AFN Regional Chiefs that make up our team on the Executive. We also have our Chiefs Committee on Education. That's the structures that we have. And so we have a very, uh, let's say it's a formal structure. But it works when proper mandates and proper processes are followed. And uh, we've got that mandate now, and the Chiefs have given direction. Get back to the table and keep reaching out and try to get that national fiscal framework in place as it relates to education. That's that's the mandate given. So, so what's still going to reach out? What kind of reaction are you getting? Lukewarm. Uh, we're still going to keep reaching out, though. Like, uh, no matter what happens, uh, we have to keep reaching out because we need that process. Yeah, I have met with, uh, with the Prime Minister. Um, try to meet with ministers as regularly as I can to try to get this back on the table. It's too important. We have uh, like we don't want any further missed opportunities when it comes to education. It's too important. We don't want an ed another generation of kids to be left out in a system that, that has to be fixed. So uh, let's leave the politics aside for a minute. We can come back to that. But the, but the uh, picture we're painting, I think, is relatively gloomy, yet the, the results from the pilot projects which you, uh, your initiative undertook we're far from gloomy. In fact, they provide some considerable grounds for optimism. Could you uh, expand on that, Mr. Martin? Yeah, and I think you've actually described it quite well, and that is to say that there are, there are reasons for great optimism. Number one is that we're dealing with this huge population of young people who are coming in. And the fact is that if we are able to do what the kinds of things that Randy Schmidt talks about, the kinds of things that the indigenous educators of this country talk about, the fact of the matter is, with that huge population, we can make phenomenal changes in the course of the next five years, and of course, obviously going. But let me just take the, I'll give you the one example that the ranch has talked about. What you hear from the government, you say to the government, look, you know, here's the comparator, here's the amount of money that goes in the, by the provincial system that's invested in education, and here is the fact that up to close to 50% of that per capita. There's a 50% discount. If you, you know, the, the fact of the matter is if you've got two schools, 10 kilometers apart, child going into grade one on reserve, it essentially will get an education that is paid, uh, that is about, if, if, it's, if you get dollar for dollar value, is anywhere from 40 to 60% less than the, the, the education of a child going to a public school 10, uh, 10 kilometers away, and it's impossible to justify that under any moral grounds or under any, any economic grounds. What you will hear from the government, if you say to the government, for heaven's sakes, you've got to increase the funding, you've got to provide fair funding, what you hear from the government is, well, we're looking for reform, and you know, uh, money doesn't buy reform. Well, the, the fact is, I don't know of an educate, of an indigenous educator. I don't know of a chief, I don't know of a band council who isn't seeking to improve the education system in their community. And for the government to come along and say, you don't want reform, that's, it's just, well, you, you're garbage. That's all I can, there is no other, there is no other description. So let, but let's take the government at their word. Let's take the government at their word. Let's say, what happens if we do demonstrate reform? This goes to the, the example that the, the, the our program that the, that the chief set up. <coughs> the, uh, a decade ago, in the province of Ontario, um, the government decided that they were going to take a look at the, te uh, the 10 worst schools in the province in terms of primary school literacy. The fact of the matter is, if you don't learn to read and write by grade three, 
you will, be, you will have to play catch up the rest of your life. And if you certainly haven't cemented that by grade six, then the odds that you're going to make it through the high school, through the high school are, virtually, are virtually nil. Fundamental basis of education is literacy and numeracy. So, the, 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 the government did the testing in, in their schools, and they then brought in a special program. They hired specialists, and they brought in a special program that over a four-year basis in Ontario essentially turned those 100 schools around until they brought their literacy levels up to the provincial level. When we learned about this, I went to the then Minister of Education, now, the pre now Premier Wynn, and I said, give us your program. And I said, give us the names of the experts who went into all of these schools and worked with the teachers to turn this around. She did. She gave us the program. We got a hold of the teachers and we said, we're going to do a pilot program in two schools, Kettle and Stony Point, as was mentioned, and Walpole Island uh, was the other, both, both reserves in southwestern Ontario. And we said, let's see if we put the money in that the province of Ontario put into their 100 schools, that we put it into these two schools with these experts, what we could do. So at the time that we did this, the, the, the province had established its, its, uh, its goal posts. And essentially, 70% um, or better of Ontarians in grades one to three achieved a pass result, which happened to be, by the way, by coincidence, 70%. In the two schools into which we went, the average at those two schools was 13% pass. In other words, a dramatic drop between the two levels. We brought the two programs in. Four and a half years later, in both Kettle and Stony Point and uh, in Walpole Island, all of the kids, one to three, all of the kids um, on the, in those two reserves, four to six, were at the national, uh, were at the provincial average in terms of read, uh, in terms of reading, and they were above the provincial average in terms of writing, and specifically the young girls on reserve. In both cases, were above the young girls who were being off reserve. It was a staggering turnaround, a staggering turnaround. And so my, I would simply say, okay, if that's the kind of reform that can be gained with this kind of money, we showed you the reform. Federal government, you give us the money. There are schools across the country now who have come to us as a result of this reserve saying, we want the program. The federal government says, we'll pay for reform. You've got reform. Now, give us the money and we'll put it into every single one of these schools. That's what that budget should have dealt with. Let's see, what they, let's see if they rise to the challenge. The other initiative was to do for older kids with the Aboriginal Entrepreneur Initiative. And uh, the National Chief mentioned uh, success comes when people see themselves in the, in the programs. And I'm wondering whether you could talk about that a little bit because I think that's what happened in that program. We, um, we went into a reserve uh, high school in Thunder Bay called Cromarty, a number of you may well know it. Um, and we essentially said, basically financial literacy is important, entrepreneurship is important, there is no business program in any of, in any of these um, on-reserve schools. So let's see uh, what can be done. We took a program that existed in some 14 countries, United Kingdom, United States, other countries. We took the provincial business courses um, and then we uh, put them in, uh, we put them, took them in this course, gave them to a young Cree teacher and asked her if she could sort of massage it around and we took the course into this high school. It was a huge success in the high school. So we extended it to another high school. We went to Children of the Earth in, uh, in, uh, in, in Winnipeg. Huge, same thing, huge success. Except that a young student came up to me at one point and said, how come all the examples that you've got are from Vancouver, and Ottawa, and Montreal, and none of them are, none, none of them are indigenous, none of them are aboriginal? That sort of struck me, that's a pretty good question. So we asked our two of our teachers to, to, to take a year off along with Nelson Publishing, we produced the first set of workbooks and textbooks teaching entrepreneurship, financial literacy, um, and basic, uh, basic business and economics, grade 11 and grade 12. 
That was four years ago. We're now in 46 schools across the country. The course has just taken off like this. The graduation rates from the high schools have gone up just like this with these kids. And the enthusiasm that these kids have got. The issue really is here we are talking about the future of the largest pop young population in our country. More kids under the age of 15, more kids under the age of 25. And they only want one thing. And their parents only want one thing. And the chiefs and the band councils and the educators in those places only want one thing. Give us the same quality education that you've got with other Canadians, and we'll show you. And one of the meetings, and I'll, I'll close on this, but the meeting on the, on the first one, on the, on, the, uh, on the literacy course, the chief from Kettle and Stony Point, at the end of the thing, got up in front of everybody, and tears rolling down his face when the dean of the Faculty of Education at the University of Toronto announced the results of the evaluation. And he just looked out and he said, you know, you think, because it was an audience that like this. He said, you think we can't do it. Well, give us the tools, and we will show you. And he was right. And for heaven's sake, let's do it. So Mr. Martin suggested these are uh, two successful programs. They seem to be. He says that, that somebody should go to the federal government and say, you want to reform, we use reform, give us the money. Have you done that? <laughs> well, not on those two specific examples, but hey, that's on my things to do list and that'll get it done. <laughs> that's a good example. It's an example, as, uh, as Prime Minister put it, you know, give us the tools, we get it done. You know, we're breaking down that stereotype of the Indians being stupid, lazy, drunk, and welfare. Like, it's, it's that's so passe. When you get the, the, the resources and the tools, you, you see what, you, you got two examples of what can happen. And, will happen. and that's a very powerful testimony of what we can be doing in this country. And it's just, again, getting governments to the table, establish the proper processes. This can get done. You know, we did, and I'm going to keep lamenting, we did miss an opportunity in this federal budget to close the gap. But there's other ones coming up. You know, there's other, this is going to be the mantra for the next one, two, well, three years you, until governments get it. You've led me into the next question very neatly. They segue into uh, back into politics and the federal election. Um, I think I've described the middle class as being squeezed, and at the moment they're being squeezed by all three parties who want to hug them to death. Um, <laughs> and at the, I guess the, uh, there's only so much room at the moment. The, the, all parties are concentrated in the middle class, maybe at the, extent, at the expense of First Nations. It does not seem to be on anybody's agenda at the moment. Nobody's talking about it. Well, again, it's, it's our job as, as leaders, as chiefs and grand chiefs and all these uh, leaders right across Canada to make our, our agenda and our priorities get onto the Liberal Party platform, get onto the Conservative Party platform, onto the NDP Party platform, onto Elizabeth May. We've met all the federal party leaders. So we have to get our objectives and our priorities onto theirs. And so I want to see that in the Liberal Party platform. You know, Mr. Trudeau, what are we going to do about treaty implementation, about education, housing, Ottawa, water? Let's have something solid. Same thing with the, that's the same message is going to go to everybody. And what we're trying to do as First Nations people is mobilize the vote. We can't tell you who to vote for, but get out and exercise that right. Because remember, we didn't have the right to vote until 61. You know? And so for a number of years, we weren't allowed to participate. But if we do organize that political power, we can influence maybe 50 ridings, depending on who you talk to, maybe more. You know? And that's got some impact. You know? Our economic power is not quite there yet. We're not all the Chief Clarence Louis and the successful, you know, we're not there yet, Chief. We're going to get there, but we can exercise the political power by getting organized, making sure that our issues are on every party platform, you know, going forward into this October 19th election. And if we hear that, loud and clear, this is what the Liberals are saying, here's the NDP are saying, who's, who's best to put these issues forward, right? So that's, that's, that's our message. Let's get out. You, uh, you know something about elections. Could this be a, a big election? <laughs> Uh, I don't think there's any doubt about it, and I think Canadians are there, but I can tell you, to answer your question, can, can this be put on the Liberal Party platform? Well, sitting over there is Carolyn Bennett, who is the Liberal critic uh, uh, for Indigenous Affairs, and sitting beside her is Joni wilson Raybould, who happens to have been the former regional chief of the AFN in British Columbia. She is also a Liberal candidate, and they will tell you those issues are already on the on the. Liberal. We're, uh, we're running close to being out of time, but just a couple of last questions. Um, 
Mr. Bellegarde, do you think a new tone needs to be uh, to be set with the federal government? Uh, we appear to be hung up on governance issues. Uh, who gets control? I mean, I realise these are not small issues, but at the same time, uh, that money is just sitting there while another uh, couple of grades of kids do not benefit from it. How do you bring the logjam? Again, the, the relationship with this government is unnecessarily adversarial. And uh, it, it's, it's even demonstrated, James and I, the special United Nations Rapporteur, even indicated that in his report. You know, the government spent $106 million on lawyers, you know, fighting rights, treaty rights, and Aboriginal rights. Not acceptable. If you embrace them, you wouldn't have to spend that much money fighting rights. Embrace your own constitution, Section 35. Existing Aboriginal treaty rights are recognized and affirmed. You know? Uh, embrace all of the Royal Proclamation of 1763, the Royal Order Council of 1870, the British North America Act, Section 9124, the Federal Response for Indians and in Indian Lands. It doesn't say Indians on Indian Lands, it says Indians and Indian Lands. So all those things we're just saying, respect your own Canada's constitution. And the, the relationship does not have to be so adversarial. You know, work with us. We can find the common ground, just establish those respectful processes. We can make that change. You know, that's what I'm going to keep saying no matter who gets into office. You know, our relationships with the Crown. Some parties are a little bit better. I can't say I'm left wing, right wing. I'm neutral. You know, I have to say that. You know, I'm not... <laughs> but I just want to see these these issues are, are not only First Nations issues. They're they're Canada's issues. You know, and again, when we win on any front as First Nations people, everybody wins. If we look at treaty land entitlement, that's that's a success story. That's economic development. We had some examples about education. That's another success story. If you move ahead. We've got to start basically looking at a policy and legislative change in Canada. That's one that's based on recognition of Aboriginal rights and title, not extinguishment of Aboriginal rights and title. That's where we need to go. And that's, I think, if we can do that, you're going to see a really, really bright future. And Canada can be held up in an example to the world of what can really happen when Indigenous people's rights are respected, honored, and recognized. That's where we need to go. Just last question. Um, where would you like to see Aboriginal education in 10 years? What, what is realistic in terms of graduation rates? I'd like to see Aboriginal uh, education. I'd like to see it funded today. On the purport to begin with, on the same level as provincial education is provided, I would then like to see the money that is provided needed for catch-up. There's 150 years behind, and I think that catch-up money has got to be there. And I can tell you one thing. If that money is provided today, Ten years, you will have an, edu an Aboriginal education system across this country that will blow your mind. It will be every single bit as, as well as any as any others. And you will also see something else. You will see the youngest and the fastest growing segment of our population filling the kinds of jobs that they can, realizing what they can. And if you want to know what a country of 34 million people should do, and what I want to see in ten years, is not waste the talents of the youngest and fastest growing segment of our country.